Welcome to another installment of the um, Six Bridges Book Festival. Um, we are so welcome, so glad today to welcome uh, Dr. Lena Wen. She is an emergency physician and public health professor at George Washington University. She is also a CNN medical analyst and contributing columnist for the Washington Post. She writes a weekly column and anchors the new um, Post newsletter, The Checkup with Dr. Wen. Previously, she served as Baltimore's health commissioner and she is the author of a new book, Lifelines, A Doctor's Journey in the Fight for Pu Public Health. It's a wonderful book and we're going to talk mostly about that today. Welcome, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for the invitation to be with you. I hope that we'll be able to do this next time in person. That would be great. It, it really would be. Um, I know you are interviewed so often about medical subjects, about COVID, about other things. And I would really like to hone in on the book today. And we may get to some of the more current questions also during this. But I would really like you to start just by talking about your uh, life in China before coming to the United States. Absolutely. And um, I want to preface and say that that was not at all my intention in writing the book, as in when I first conceived of them, of the idea of writing Lifelines, it was not called Lifelines. Um, mm -hmm. It was actually called the first title for the book was Doctor for the City, because I had wanted to talk about my experience leading Baltimore's health department and the incredible work that my team and our partners across the city did in, for example, saving over 3,000 lives from opioid overdose in a three-year period, or cutting infant mortality by 38% in our city within a seven-year period through our program, Be More for Healthy Babies. I think there's so many untold stories from the front lines of public health, and I wanted to be to help to be able to tell them. But actually, I submitted the first version of the book to my publisher. These are the, th this was way before COVID, which is another story altogether, mm -hmm. because by the time that my book was written and was about it to be published, been. we had a pandemic. And so right, I had right. to go back and the parts of the book that are about coronavirus were put in later. But I had initially um, submitted the book to my publisher with the chapters from Baltimore. And my publisher essentially said, this is great, but it's kind of like telling people they have to eat their vegetables. <laughs> As in, you're telling people they should care about public health, but they don't care about you. And so is there a way to tell your story in a way that also highlights the centrality of public health? And so I went back and wrote part one of the book. The book is in three parts. Baltimore became part two, part three became COVID, and part one was about my upbringing. And so to your question, Susan, um, I was born in China. My parents and I came to the U.S. just before I turned eight. We came with $40, and we also initially settled in a little town in the mountains of, of Utah, Logan, Utah, before moving mm -hmm. out to, to, um, to California. And, you know, those days were difficult. Um, we, my parents, despite working multiple jobs, we had difficulties making ends meet. We depended on Medicaid, children's health insurance program for our health care. We depended on WIC. Um, when my mother was pregnant with my little sister, we depended on food stamps at times. We lived in public housing. And in my writing lifelines, there were so many experiences in my upbringing here in the U.S that made me realize how much, how fortunate we are. That I think so often these, so, these social safety net programs are described as quote entitlements, when for mm -hmm. us, it was really our lifeline. It was how we were able to, to have the opportunities that allowed me and then my little sister to really fulfill our parents' Succeed. wildest dreams for us. Lena, you, you start the book in a very, very dramatic way. And that is you as a child, um, I think you had moved to California by that time, but you were a child, you had asthma yourself, but a, a neighbor child became very ill with asthma. And uh, that's a good introduction to public health or the absence of it. That's right. Um, I start the book 
purposefully with this story because it is a scene that not all the memories of my childhood are this clear. In fact, a lot mm -hmm. of memories I probably had hidden away or in some ways are a bit fuzzy, as in I'm not quite sure how, how much of it is other people have told me or I saw photographs and then had to piece things together. But this one is crystal clear as if it happened yesterday. There was a neighbor child, I think I was about 10 and the child was about seven or eight at the time who lived in the same apartment block as me. And I knew him a little bit because we would walk to school together. One day I heard his grandmother shouting for help. And I knew he had asthma, as did I, as do a lot of children. And I could see when I went into his apartment that he was really struggling to breathe. And I knew that feeling very well. When you have asthma, you know you can take a deep breath in, but you can't exhale. And then you get to the point of you don't know when you're going to be able to take another breath. And I could see that he was at that point and there was an empty inhaler lying on the ground. I thought at that moment, I knew he needed help. I mean, I was often hospitalized for my asthma and I knew that he had gotten to this point too. The thing was his grandmother was too afraid to call for help because she was afraid that if she called, it wasn't just health people who would come, it would be immigration authorities and the family was undocumented and she was afraid of being deported. As a result, there was a delay. And by the time she actually called for help, it was too late. And this child died right in front of me, struggling to breathe due to something that I knew was a preventable illness. So I had the sense from that early age of how much we in this society do not value people the same way. And also how much health and health care should be a human right. But that is not how it's understood in our society today. And there, there were other people, I mean, one of the overriding uh, themes of the book for me is that almost every aspect of life and struggle in life is public health in some way, you know, or at least can involve public health. So there are other people, um, one of uh, a fellow um, was not able to afford his medications for seizure disorder so that he also um, uh, died because of, of the lack of um, ability of medicine for all people. This was before the um, uh, uh, affordable health care. Uh, then there was another fellow, uh, another Tony, um, who also happened while you were in Los Angeles. You know? And these stories um, really did bring forward that, that looking at the provision of healthcare in this country, it's not an evil playing field. You know, there are people who have access to healthcare and people who don't. Um, that's right. Um, and I'm so glad you mentioned this because that aspect, that fundamental unfairness is very much what drew me into medicine and specifically to working in the emergency department, because especially in the days before the Affordable Care Act, I never wanted to be in a position where I had to turn away a patient because mm -hmm. of inability to pay, because of the type of insurance they had or didn't have, or because of where they happen to come from and where they happen to, to be born. Um, and yet it was also working in the ER that I saw the other aspect of what you mentioned, which is how much of health is not just dependent on the care that you receive. Certainly that's an important component of it and you need to have access to the best care possible. But there are other things that matter to your life too. The air that we breathe, the food that we have access to, all those also tie to this concept of health. And that broadly is what public health is all about. The, the other child, the other Tony, if I remember, um, they were at, he got very good care within the hospital, but then went back home to a, an area of town where there were um, you know, industrial chemicals in the air and other things that made control of his asthma very, very difficult for him. Um, one thing that was interesting to me was that that you talk about the decision um, or the, the and it is a decision to go to college at age 13 was not so much from an academic point of view, um, but from a financial point of view. 
Um, can you tell us about that? Sure. Well, when people find out that I started college at age 13 and graduated at 18 and went to medical school at that age, I often have people assume that I must have been very smart and that maybe I didn't go to high school because it was too boring or something. And that was not at all the case. Um, I My parents were really struggling in those days, as I mentioned, financially. I wanted to find a way to help them with the bills and there weren't a lot of things I could do in terms of working while maintaining my studies. I saw mm -hmm. an advertisement for a work study program at California State University in Los Angeles. And I also knew that they had an early entrance option for younger people to be able to test in to college. So for me, this was a very much of a transactional arrangement, as in mm -hmm. I thought that if I were able to test into college, I would be able to work. My tuition would be would would be mainly covered through through this program. Um, in fact, entirely covered through this program, and I would also be able to work and and help my with with my family as well. And so it was something that I decided to do. I would say very reluctantly, as in really? I really did not. You know, I finally my because of our financial circumstances, we had moved around a lot. I was a shy child. Um, I talked in the book about how I grew up with a severe speech impediment, had a lot of difficulty making friends. I finally was in a place where I thought I could enter high school and potentially be in the same grade or be in the same class with other people and not have to move around anymore. So to be able to, to leave that and enter this unknown where I had to accept basically that I would not have friends during all of college because I was working and because I was younger than than other people. I mean, I I wouldn't, I have two children now, I would not want them to go through what I did. I mean, if for whatever reason, they really, you know, there could be exceptional circumstances, I'm not saying never, ever, right. but rather that I would not choose this path for anyone else. It was actually really a really miserable experience. Um, mm -hmm. And I didn't really make real friends. I had a couple of very good friends in medical school, but I didn't make real friends until I was in my mid-20s, and I would not yeah. wish that upon anyone. Yeah, that's very hard. Um, also, you had wonderful mentors all the way along, and, and that really started, I think, maybe at, at uh, college, who, though you were not, you were not um, comfortable in saying that you wanted to be a physician, and they kept kind of pressing you to to want more because they thought you could do it. So they, they sounded very helpful to you. And uh, mentors became uh, a really part of, a good part of your, not only your education, but your, your life in Baltimore too. So if you would like to transition into Baltimore, I mean, there are wonderful things about the, sure. the training along the way, but I know Baltimore is your, is your pride and joy. Um, Although if I could mention, if I could make a note on the mentorship part, if I may, sure. Susan, um, I mean, you brought it up and also it was such an important, you're totally right that it's such an important part of my life. And I spent a lot of time in lifelines um, talking about my, my mentors. I, I, um, I also end the book in that way. I, I don't want to give it away, but I do end the book um, with a, um, with a tribute to my mentors and okay. with an epilogue that specifically focuses on key lessons that I learned from various mentors over the years and how I would especially advise young people today as they're looking to to see the type of difference that that they can each be, be making. Um, mm -hmm. But you mentioned one of my mentors, Dr. Raymond Garcia, in, um, in college. Right. I had entered as this young student without friends, without networks, and I was afraid to tell people that I really wanted to be a doctor because I thought that they would laugh at me. I thought, who was going to believe me if I say that I want to be a doctor when I don't have any connections? I don't have family who are doctors in the U.S., and I didn't know literally how one does that. Mm -hmm. I told whenever people ask me what I wanted to do, I said that I wanted to be a lab tech because mm -hmm. I was a biochemistry major. My work study was in a lab. And so I thought this was believable. And also my parents had a friend whose daughter was a lab tech. So I thought this is a path that I can aspire to. And, and it's, it's one that I, I understand. Well, Dr. Garcia kept on asking me, what is it that you really want to do? And at some point I told him, well, maybe I want to go to medical school, although I don't know how I would do that. 
And he said, well, I can help you. He introduced me to his former students who were in medical school or in residency. And they taught me so much about the unwritten rules of the road. Right. Things that, especially pre-Google days, I mm -hmm. had no way of finding out, for example, how to do a clinical clerkship, how to do a volunteer, how what kinds of volunteer experiences really counted. I didn't even know about the importance of taking test prep classes for my MCATs and how important that was going to be. These are things that might be so intuitive to people if they're surrounded by other pre-meds, if they have a great a college with a strong pre-med office. That's not what I had access to. And that's yeah. the story for so many people um, around the country. And I think it just is a, there's a line that to transition to Baltimore, one of the reasons I felt so strongly about my job in Baltimore as the health commissioner and just in general is this concept that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. Mm -hmm. And so, so much of the work we do in public health and also in academia and in many other aspects, it's to help to, lay, to level that playing ground of inequality. Mm -hmm. That, that's wonderful. And I really liked both how you used mentor and became mentor to the people who work with you in Boston. I mean, in, in Baltimore, excuse me. So um, uh, one of the, the um, scenarios in Boston, and if I'm going to get you in the right city, in Baltimore <laughs> that I um, really enjoyed, but also felt a pang in my heart too, was that early on you met with a group of children that were eight to 15 years old. And you had anticipated that the things that they would want to be talking about were about sex and smoking and condoms and you know, sort of universal teen um, thoughts maybe, but that was not it. They wanted to talk about addiction and mental health because that's what they were either personally facing or certainly in their families and community. And um, that was a really strong beginning to your work to help with addiction. And I, I would like to have you talk about that if you would. Well, when I first started in my role in Baltimore, I went on a listening tour and I went around to various community groups asking them, what is it that you think we should be focusing on in the health department? Mm -hmm. And one of the experiences is the one that you were describing of visiting a group of young people. And I don't know exactly what I thought that they would be telling me, but I really was not expecting this. I, I'd actually um, come from a meeting that morning with a bunch of medical students where I was teaching mm -hmm. medical students about, about, um, about overdose and opioid overdose or what it looks like when people are overdosing. I remember talking to these med students and they would give me very clinical answers. They're med students. And so when I asked them, for example, what does it look like if somebody is overdosing? They would say decreased respiratory rate, pinpoint pupils, right? Things that are pretty right. clinical in nature. Well, I came to speak with this group of young people and these young people started describing to me what it looked like when somebody was overdosing and how they were the ones who were reviving their mother, how they were the ones that saved the life of their uncle. They were telling me about how I remember this one eight year old said to me, he wonders what's the point of getting up in the morning because he's the only one in his family who does because everybody else is addicted to drugs. I mean, it was so abundantly clear to me that addiction, mental health, trauma, these tied to every aspect of our city. And it tied to education and to the opportunities that these children would have. It tied to criminal, criminal justice and public safety. It tied to the ability of people to be productive in their workforce. Um, and so I thought this has to be one of the top issues that we focused on, addiction and mental health. And in fact, it was. So one of the first things that we did was work with our state legislature to get legislation changed so that I became the single prescriber for naloxone. That, that was just antidote in marvelous. I mean, because you have instant access if someone wants to, to um, use the naloxone to, to treat someone, you, you prescribe for everybody. I mean, you that was a great way to do it. And essentially, we made naloxone over the counter and available to everyone in our city. And that's what people use to save over 3000 lives in a three year period. Although I will say that there are there are people who have criticized our naloxone program and said, but this is not long term treatment. And they're absolutely right. There's more that needs to be done, a lot more that needs to be done when it comes to fighting stigma, when it comes to increasing treatment 
for the disease of addiction. And we worked on that too. We also started a 24 seven stabilization center. That's the beginning of an ER as I envision it for mental health and addiction. We worked with hospitals to, um, to, to increase access. I mean, we, we did all these things. And I, I think it's, you know, it's important to, uh, to acknowledge that we were also working on long-term treatment, but mm -hmm. at the same time, if somebody is dead right now, there's no chance for a better tomorrow. And so it is really crucial to um, to get to save lives and to do what you can. And I think that's one of the lessons that I talked about throughout the book is you have to marry the commitment to long term action with short term steps, too, and right. that you cannot let perfect be the enemy of the good. They are they You can do both. You can work on overcoming long term systemic inequities and addressing racism in our healthcare system, in our society. You can do all these things while also choosing tangible short-term solutions along the way. The, the stabilization center just sounded really good. I mean, there are so many things that, that you did in Baltimore that I, I wish maybe locally we had access here to the same thing or some, a champion um, and a group that would look at that as a community need. But at, at least at this point, that is not, not true here. Um, and when people come to the ER and they have the crisis at that point, not to be able to access care, if they come in and are, are, have overdosed and are, are willing to really work on treatment, just to be told, you know, call this person, call this person, and it circles back and, you know, somebody said, well, call the ER. Well, I'm, I'm in the ER, I'm looking for care. Um, it was it was really good to have a way that they could more quickly ask, access the care. Um, incremental change is not bad. You know, sometimes it 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 sort of gets talked about. Of you, you you need to make the push to do everything right now. But you also said if if everything is the priority, nothing is the priority. I mean, you you need to pick small areas where you can have more immediate successes. Um, talk some about the idea of, of social determinants of, of health um, and, and how, that was, um, how that was true in Baltimore and how, it's, how you view it now when you are on a more national um, platform. Um. So the concept of social determinants of health is this idea that health is not just determined by healthcare, that there are so many other aspects. I mean, you had mentioned the other Tony earlier, this mm -hmm. boy that I'd gotten to know in the ER because he came in all the time with asthma. Now, what was happening was that he, it wasn't that he needed a better inhaler. It's that he and his mother were experiencing homelessness. They were going in between different shelters where people around them smoked. At some point, they were living across the street from an incinerator. I mean, those other elements very much had an impact on his overall health and well-being. Or another case, let's think about, are we were, we're talking about food access. We, I can tell my patient who has diabetes to eat better foods, but what if she tells me that she lives in a food desert, which, by the way, one in three African Americans in Baltimore live in a food desert without access to healthy food compared to one in 12 whites. Now, what happens if that if if she's then telling me that I have to take two buses and then walk 10 blocks to go to a grocery store? And by the way, it's then a Whole Foods and it's too expensive for me to afford anyway. I mean, those issues, housing, food access, et cetera, also very much impact our health too. And so those are the social determinants <coughs> that we see uh, play out. Do you, do you feel you have a platform about that now, um, you know, in your work on CNN? Well, I think we see the social determinants very much play out in COVID-19. Mm -hmm. As with most things, COVID did not create issues of health disparities. Um, but certainly did unmask them and also unveiled these other issues that are so integrally tied to health as well, including the importance of social determinants of health. I mean, we know that this pandemic did not affect populations equally, that mm -hmm. African Americans, Latino Americans, Native Americans have had disproportionate levels of disease and death. And it's not because the virus is somehow 
doing the discriminating, but rather that these are communities that may have may may have a higher rate of living in crowded multi generational housing, or maybe essential workers have a higher proportion of essential workers who didn't have the privilege of physical distancing. And so I thought so I think we see this very much playing out um, in the time of COVID as well, that there are so many other issues that that tie to health. Um, politics. Uh cannot be ignored when you are in a position like being health commissioner. Um, um, how did you deal with the political ups and downs uh, of the, you had champions at some times and, and politicians who were not so much a champion of, of public health, but you certainly had champions there too and, and mentors. You know, I think one aspect of working in local, state, or federal public health that people must recognize is that these are political jobs. And in order to be effective, you have to understand politics. One thing that I cited of another mentor of mine, Dr. Boris Lushniak, the former acting Surgeon General, is you can be political, but not partisan. As in, <clears throat> the work that you do is not about being Republican or Democrat but it is about understanding politics and navigating politics. As you mentioned, working with your champions and people who understand this world and can help to uh, help to help further navigate these, the, these dynamics too. And so I think that is a big part of it is working with trusted voices who can help to amplify these messages. Uh, I, I enjoyed the, um, the program that was developed because of a, of a uh, very involved community person about the glasses in, in Baltimore. Uh, that, was a, that was a neat coming together of interests. Well, um, I, I think you, know, you can see that I wear glasses. I often wear mm -hmm. contacts, but you know, a lot of us were diagnosed with vision issues when we were children. And I think we don't need another study to tell us that if kids can't see, they can't read. So getting glasses for children is not the only intervention, of course, when it comes to improving educational outcomes, but certainly is a pretty clear cut one that I think people can agree to. And yet there was a study done in Baltimore that found that up to 10,000 of our school kids needed glasses, but didn't have them. And that's because of a number of issues, including people didn't know what insurance they had access to. There were barriers when it came to screening. Some people, some kids who screened as needing glasses, just somehow the information never got to their parents. And as a result, all these kids potentially could have been labeled as being troublemakers and been put back in school and put back in grades when all they needed was a pair of glasses. And so we worked with a number of partners across the city, Johns Hopkins, Warby Parker, the glasses company, um, Vision to Learn, a national nonprofit, along with a whole host of other um, of, of other philanthropists and nonprofits. And we started this program called Vision for Baltimore that was all about getting eyeglasses and screening and um, and and all these tests and glasses made available to children without the kids having to miss school, without parents and caregivers having to miss work, without having insurance being a barrier. And so I think that's one example of something really tangible that can be done in service of our most vulnerable. The, the Safe Streets program also um, was, was in, well, a lot of communities use people who have been involved in violence themselves, but you um, talk about violence being a communicable disease um, and that, that violence begets violence. Uh, using those people, not those people, using people who have suffered that and the consequences of that themselves are, are good folks to, to help to, to bring the community this hopefully some peace there. Yeah, I mean, there's a national program called Cure Violence that first started in Chicago that um, the Safe Streets Baltimore is modeled after. And it's the idea that 
you have to treat violence like a contagious disease, just like you have flu or COVID. These are things that are transmitted from person to person. There's a way to prevent the spread of violence and there, there is a way to treat it once it occurs and to stop the perpetuation of the cycle of violence and trauma. And so part of it involves changing the norms in the community. And that includes hiring people who are from the community that, that they're serving people often who were recently released from incarceration to walk the streets and they will understand, they will know the dynamics of the community. They also know who might be having trouble with whom, they might know who can be brought out of this cycle with additional resources, including resources for jobs and educational training and so forth. And so this was a very successful program, still going very strong in Baltimore now. The sites are expanded under, under the, the now mayor. And I, I hope that many more places will look at examples like this as, mm -hmm. a, as an approach. Basically, the idea that public safety and public health have to work hand in hand and that public health has using a public health approach can have many benefits when it comes to improving public safety too. One of the, one of the um, immediate uh, challenges that you had to deal with was the, um, Freddie Gray, uh, the death of Freddie Gray, who was in police custody and died sometime later of, of injuries that included a broken neck. And Baltimore burned. I mean, Baltimore, there was such a reaction in the community from this. And one of the one of the uh, healthcare units that you had was in the in the direct line of the you know the 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 action from the reaction from the community. Um, but it was interesting how that unit, uh, what you found in that unit uh, after that evening. It, it you had been called to to see and. And the only um, only thing that had been taken from the from a break in was food. Right. I'm a, I I think there needs to be a bit more context on this on, on this one, and I also don't want to give it away because this okay. is actually one of the crucial parts of of, of lifelines. Okay. Um, right. But um, I would just say that there is a um, I think there is often a tendency to look at individuals as the perpetrators of a crime without understanding the context of their lives. And I talk about in, in the book about how, you know, this is not meant to be a some kind of indictment of our criminal justice system at, at all, but rather that, for example, treating addiction as a crime um, has many limitations, including that it really is a disease. Um, of treating people as perpetrators without understanding the trauma that may have gone on in their lives is also not really helping anyone. And so I go into, there are some stories that I don't want to give away that are really okay. important in lifelines with the proper context. Okay. Um, can you talk about your relationship with your mother, uh, which was not always an easy relationship, um, but um, there was there was growth in for both of you in that relationship as time went on. Well, there was definitely room on my end, <laughs> although I don't think that I, you know, I am my relationship with my mother was not something I had intended to write about in Life Lines, right? It was meant to be about the work that we did in Baltimore. And so um, I, I, it was really not something that I had done much reflection on, mm -hmm. but I couldn't write a story of my childhood without reflecting on the relationship that I had with, with my mother. And so much of it, you know, I remember growing up being really resentful of my mother because she wasn't there. And then when I wrote Lifelines, I actually came to see very clearly why she wasn't there. Yeah. She was studying the way that we were able to leave China was when she was, when she was, she had to get into a graduate program in the US. Then she was studying for her PhD while cleaning hotel rooms and working in a video store. Then she studied to be a teacher and in the meantime was still working a number of part-time jobs. And so I, I remember growing up, my mother was never at parent-teacher conferences or concerts or other things. And I always thought, well, why? Well, I think in writing Lifelines, I really came to see all the sacrifices that she made. I mean, I remember 
growing up that I really resented having mm-hmm. to be awakened in the middle of the night because my mother would make she would ask me to memorize a hundred vocabulary words every day. Why? Because I didn't speak English. And so this was the way that she was teaching me English. Then I had to memorize the word, the definition, the spelling and so forth. And she would quiz me at night, but she would only come home well after I went to sleep. And I was so grumpy. I mean, you know, as a kid, right? Yeah, you're grumpy. You yeah. wake up and, and you don't really want to be drilled to vocabulary words at 11 o'clock at night. Although now as a working mom of two little kids, I can only imagine how tired my mother must have been. Mm-hmm. After having studied and worked, I'm sure the last thing she wanted to do was to wake up a grumpy kid and then be subject to insults and then, and the, you know, and then drill on vocabulary words when I'm sure all she wanted to do was to take a bath and, and go to bed. But those were the sacrifices that she went through in order to make a better life for, for me and for my sister. So, so much of, of my upbringing and in writing lifelines ended up becoming a recognition of all that my mother went through. I didn't really make peace with my mother until after she was diagnosed with what turned out to be metastatic breast cancer when I was a medical student. We had a very different relationship for the few years that she was fighting her cancer. But I think had she been alive, if she were alive now, we would have moved into a yet very different place still because I think all the time when I look into my children's eyes, how much my mother would have wanted to be here to mm-hmm. get to know them and how much she would have loved them. And I think we would have related on a whole different level that I'll never find out. Speaking as a, as a retired hospice physician, one of the, the really good things, if I may talk about that, it was, was ultimately she, had, she initiated a conversation with you about what she did and did not want um, at the end of her care. And that was, it was lovely. And uh, we'll let people read about how you dealt with that too. Um, Chiku, if I'm saying that, that is the Mandarin pronunciation, um, starts off the book almost. Uh, the, 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 you talk about that and the, that's um, eat bitter and uh, how that, if you'll talk about how that affected you, both in China and in understanding your family. Yeah, chiku, which means to eat bitter, has a second part of that phrase, which is supposed to mean that you eat bitter in order to taste sweet, meaning that you're sacrificing to get mm-hmm. something in the future. Mm-hmm. And it was meant to be a generational sense, as in your grandparents suffered for your parents, your parents are suffering for you, et cetera. I mean, there's very much the sense of obligation that then you have as a result of all these people whose shoulders that you stand on and all that that, that they have done. I, I understood growing up about some of the sacrifices. I could see them firsthand with with my parents and how they gave up everything in China to come to the US. We were fortunate to be able to stay eventually on political asylum. And I think that sense of obligation very much carries with me now, although I still learned so much about my family's past in writing this book, so much of my parents' struggles I don't how did I you really how did you learn more about your family in the process? I mean, what what were your did you take time to think about it? Or I mean, your sister was younger than you, so she she may not have known more of the family stories than you did. But how did you how did you access that either emotionally or or just uh, you know, intellectually? Well, a lot of it was my own. They were my own memories. And I mean, my actually the best person in the family who would have known all this was my mother, and she obviously mm-hmm. was not accessible. Um, she had passed away uh, in 2010, and so obviously I was not able to ask her these questions. Although she kept various things, I mean, she kept not exactly a diary, but she there were pieces of there were many pieces of paper. She wrote letters, so I was able to piece things together in part based on her writings. 
I also, um, even though you're right, my, my little sister is more than 11 years younger than me. And so wasn't around for, for, uh, for much of this. She actually um, decided that she was going to live in China for a period of time. And so she got to know some of my, my relatives in China, my cousins and others in a way that I have not gotten to know them as an adult. And so she helped me with certain pieces of, of my family history as well. But a lot of it really was through thinking and, re and remembering many things I had blocked out and just did not, you know, did not even want to think about. Um, there were mm -hmm. surprises for both my, my sister and my husband in reading the book because there were parts of my childhood that they had not known about. Well, um, it, I, I think it was a, that was a special part. I mean, I, I know you, your purpose, your impetus for writing this was about um, the um, public health situation, not situation, programs that you worked on and established in, in Baltimore. And I want to give you the opportunity, um, if you, if there are any that I haven't asked you about that you would like to, to bring up and, uh, you know, uh, you say in there with, with good reason, you need to not toot your own horn, but you need to speak of successes. Um, lots of people speak of difficulties, but you had many, many successes there. So are there more things that you would like to share? Well, a good portion of this book, the entire second part of this book, which is about half the book is talking about not necessarily the successes in Baltimore, but how we came to decide on these programs. My um, my uh, former mayor, our former mayor, the one who initially hired me, Stephanie Rowling Blake, liked to say that if everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. And so I wanted to go through the the process of explaining why we decided on the programs that we did, why some worked out and some didn't. And I think talking about the strategy of how we thought through these programs and navigating the science as well as the politics was really important because, as we know now, public health is not just about getting the science right. Public mm -hmm. health is also about maintaining and maintaining the public's trust, because once that's lost, it's very difficult to get back and public health entirely hinges on that public trust and winning over hearts and minds as well. And so I think that's another part of um, of of this book is explaining how we came to these programs. Why is it that we wanted to focus on overdose and fentanyl? What were the political reasons for doing that in addition to the public health reasons? And then um, Be More for Healthy Babies, I talked about it a bit, but is also a very important part of the book. One of the other priorities, uh, we had three priorities coming in, addiction and mental health, youth health and wellness, and caring for the most vulnerable. We really wanted to focus on our young people, our youth. And what better place to begin than with assisting pregnant women and postpartum families. And so we had this program, this collaboration of over 150 partners in the city to do one thing, which is to reduce infant mortality. And we were really proud of the fact that we were able to reduce infant mortality by 38% in seven years, but also very importantly, cut the disparity between black and white infant mortality by over 50% in that same time period. And that's an illustration of how it's, it disparities, it's not a zero sum game. You don't add years of life to one group of people by cutting years of life from another. That when you focus on the most vulnerable, all boats rise, you're able to help everyone. And I think that aspect of helping the most disadvantaged and also making sure that we have opportunity for everyone, that's a key principle of public health and of the work that we did in Baltimore. Well, our time together is, is coming to an end. I really appreciate your, your uh, coming to be with us virtually today. And again, her book is just wonderful. I heartily recommend it to you. Um, for those watching this, you can get this available at our local bookstore at Wordsworth. Um, we uh, will make a link available to you to do that, but you will find this book anywhere. And, um, you will enjoy reading it. One personal question before we go. What do you do to kick back? Just yeah. relax. Yeah, I mean, I. Um, <laughs> it's a very good question. So I recently started learning how to swim. Mm 
which was something that I never did as, as a child and actually was terrified of the water until pretty recently. And so um, swimming now for me is a great way to disconnect also because you can't check your email and <laughs> really be on the phone while you're, while you're in the water anyway. True, true. So that's, that's been an important component of physical as well as mental well well-being. Good. Well, thank you very much. Again, Dr. Lena Wen, Lifelines. Bye. Thank you.